Okay, welcome back to our Chapter 7 uh, video series from our Zane State Physics class. And at the end of the last video, um, we had just finished up this example, but I, I did feel like I was a bit rushed. I was coming up on my 15-minute time limit. So I want to kind of go back and recap this example and exactly what it means. So essentially what we're saying here is if we look at the conservation of momentum, knowing that the momentum before and after a collision will be conserved, and we look at the conservation of kinetic energy, that all of the kinetic energy before and after a collision uh, is conserved, and we add these two equations together, the, um, the initial b velocities cancel out, the final um, b velocities cancel out, and what we are left with here is uh, the, um, no, I'm sorry, the over here it's the final a velocities. We've got uh, positive and negative, they cancel each other out. And uh, what we end up here with is this equation saying that the final b velocity is equal to the initial a velocity. And if we take these two equations and instead of adding them together, if we subtract them, a velocity a minus velocity a, those terms will cancel out. And I'll be left uh, with uh, velocity b minus a velocity b will give me 2b uh, on this side, uh, or on one side of the equation, 2 velocity b. And on the other side, uh, if I take um, a velocity b minus final velocity b minus final velocity b they cancel out and I end up uh, here with a velocity final velocity a minus a negative velocity a so that's uh, going to be two velocity a and then we can just cancel out the twos and um, oh that was final by the way so we're saying the final a velocity is equal to the initial b velocity. So let's pause a moment here and think about what that really means. We've got two objects uh, such as billiard balls. They're going to have a collision and um, what we can expect to happen is that uh, whatever the velocity is of, of the first ball coming into that um, collision, it is going to transfer its velocity to object B and uh, whatever the initial velocity of B was it is going to transfer it to A so they're basically going to swap velocities so if they're traveling at each other directly with the same velocity one to the right and one to the left they'll just simply bounce off of each other and then the one will go off to the left and one will go off to the right so the velocity to the left got transferred to the other ball, and this right velocity gets transferred to the other ball, and they just kind of swap the velocities. Uh, also, what is also true is if we have one ball that is at rest and not going anywhere, and uh, another ball comes along and strikes it, the velocity of this ball is going to be transferred to the other one. And this uh, ball number two, which had a velocity of zero, will essentially be dumped off onto one. So uh, ball number one will remain still, and ball two will travel with the velocity that um, ball number one had. So this may seem a bit confusing, um, but uh, basically we're saying that when two objects collide in an elastic collision, they switch or swap velocities. And uh, again, I want to point out, um, I believe this equation right here is necessary for at least one of the homework problems. This is derived from the conservation of kinetic energy, the sort of a simplified form for objects uh, having the same velocity striking each other.
Now, I've been trying to add uh, the caveat to all of these collision problems that these collisions are one-dimensional because uh, if you've ever played pool or billiards, you know that the, the balls rarely strike each other dead on in just one dimension. The whole idea of the game is to uh, have one ball strike the other one um, in such a way that their uh, centers of mass are, are slightly off center from each other. In other words, you would take ball A and hit it slightly to the left or slightly to the right of the center of B in order to cause the balls to deflect off at different angles. So the math here uh, becomes a little hairy. Uh, so we're not going to solve a problem uh, like this, but we do need to understand conceptually what happens. So if object A strikes B in such a way that A goes off uh, above the x-axis at an angle theta, and B goes down uh, below the x-axis with a, an angle theta, if these um, objects have the same mass, their um, horizontal, the horizontal components of these momentums, so momentum is a vector, We've got this vector is diagonal, which means it has both a vertical and horizontal component. And this one down here has a vertical and horizontal component. Uh, the sum of the horizontal components, if we add them together, they are going to be equal to the initial uh, momentum of this object here, um, assuming that um, this ball was initially at rest or this object was at rest. So the horizontal components of the momentum are conserved and uh, these vertical components, they cannot just appear out of nowhere um, because of the conservation of momentum. It can't be created or destroyed. Um, it, it just can't materialize out of nowhere. But if we look at the system as a whole, the momentum of this object going up is going to be equal and opposite to this momentum going down. So the two vertical components cancel each other out. Okay, so uh, momentum is conserved in the direction of the initial momentum. So in this case, in the horizontal direction, the sum of this momentum and this momentum uh, equal this initial momentum. And in the vertical direction, the two horizontal components cancel each other out. Okay, so I mentioned center of mass in the previous slide, talking about how when you're playing pool, you want uh, one ball to strike the other uh, in such a way that um, if I've got two billiard balls here and this ball is traveling, and it does not pass directly through the center of mass of the second ball, um, it isn't going to cause one-dimensional uh, motion, it will cause two-dimensional motion uh, because the, the collision did not pass exactly through the center of mass of the ball. Now when we're talking about billiard balls, it's very easy to visualize or understand the center of mass because it is the actual center of that sphere. It's the geometric center. But we deal with all sorts of moving objects that have very irregular shapes. But even irregular shapes have a center of mass. And that center of mass, when the object, um, for instance, is moving through the air in, in um, projectile motion, uh, follows the predictable uh, parabolic path here. Um, even if the object is rotating as well as translating. So in this example B here, the diver isn't just simply uh, moving or translating through the air, but she is also rotating. And um, so if we looked at, for instance, her head, her head is not her center of mass. And if we followed its path, it is going to kind of make a weird kind of curly Q path, but if we focus on just the center of mass, it follows along the predictable parabolic path. 
So um, when we look at these irregularly shaped objects and we want to kind of simplify a problem uh, about the way it's moving through the air, uh, what we are, like if we do a free body diagram and just represent that object with a single point, that single point is the center of mass. So the total motion that's going on here, for instance, here we see a, a wrench flying through the air. Uh, we have the center of mass represented by these red X's traveling in a horizontal line, but it's also rotating as it uh, translates. And so um, the total amount of motion um, on any point of uh, this, would, uh, this wrench would be equal to both the translational and rotational motion. So if you, uh, you know, could shrink yourself down like Ant-Man and hold on to, let's say, the, uh, the end of the handle, you would be moving faster than you would be if you were just uh, resting right there on the wrench. Because in, in both cases, you're translating to the right. But at the end of the handle, you're also rotating about the center of the wrench. So you have uh, two forms of motion occurring. So um, there are various ways that you can find this, where the center of mass of an object is. You can find it experimentally um, if you have the, the physical object itself. But to find it theoretically for an object, um, it, uh, it has to be a pretty simplified uh, shape or situation. Um, but let's look at this example here where we have uh, two two weights, two uh, masses, mass A, mass B, and they are located along this x-axis. Um, so their, their centers of mass are, are just centered right in, in the, the middle of these points. Maybe they're little tiny spheres, or we could just treat them as points in space, but we know exactly where their individual uh, centers of mass are. But let's say we want to take the two of them as a pair, uh, and find out where is the, the center of mass uh, for the pair of them. How can we find that? And the way we do that is essentially like a weighted average. Okay, so the location, the x location of the center of mass is the mass A times its distance x from some established frame of reference. So in this case here, it's this y-axis we're going to measure from mass a times the distance xa plus mb times its distance xb and then we divide those uh, products by the sum of the masses and uh, we can just use a big capital m to represent the total mass and this is basically just like a weighted average we're taking the these two products divided by the total mass and it is giving us the distance to the center of mass of the system Here's an example where we have a family um, on a uh, banana boat. Um, and um, we want to know where is the center of mass. So we have these two sitting up near the front. And this one way at the back. Where is the center of mass going to be? Uh, we could guess that it's eh, probably going to be around here somewhere. But we want to find out specifically uh, where it is, and we can calculate that. So if we use the tail end of this boat as the reference, and um, also in the problem statement, uh, we're going to assume that they all have equal mass. Uh, oops, wrong way. Um, we can find that by taking the mass of this person, uh, m times the distance from the back of the boat to that person, 1 times 1.0 plus um, this person is five meters away from the back of the boat so that's going to be m times 5.0 and the third person is six meters away m times 6.0 and we're going to divide all of this by 3m and unfortunately i'm coming up on my 15 minutes so I'll have to pause the video here and 
resume it.